Hello, my name is Adrian Martin, and for World Oceans Day, I'd like to tell you about the most bizarre, exciting, and important place you have never heard of, the ocean's twilight zone. So what is the twilight zone? Vast. This huge ecosystem stretches all the way around the Earth, through all our oceans. As you might guess from its name, it begins where sunlight fades out, around 200 metres down. Following it downwards, by the time we reach its base, the pressure of the one kilometre of water now above us is equivalent to this rather uncomfortable sounding analogy. This may make it sound very inhospitable, but the twilight zone is full of an impressive diversity of life. It has many extraordinary creatures adapted to life in this challenging environment. For example, they may be bioluminescent for camouflage or have huge mouths to make the most of rare encounters with prey in the dark. There are many twilight zone creatures that are likely to be new and frankly alien looking to you, such as this common fangtooth. But there are others you are much more likely to have heard of. Giant squid versus sperm whale, the ocean's top of the bill fight. And it takes place in the twilight zone. Duels between these two huge creatures have been the stuff of myths and movies for decades. Here are just two rather imaginative illustrations by just one artist. Although he did even more pictures of the same tussle, this wasn't his niche career. He was also the illustrator of the original Sherlock Holmes book. Anyway, back to the pictures. I say imaginative for a reason. At the time these pictures were created, no one had seen a living giant squid. In fact, no one had until quite recently. Apart from a few sorry looking dead specimens washed up on beaches, we only knew them from bits found in the stomachs of sperm whales. That has changed. We now have live sightings of giant squid, either washed up in the shallows or being drawn to the surface by bait. Just check out YouTube. This spectacular clip though, shows one hunting in its natural environment, the twilight zone, drawn to a fake lure masquerading as a jellyfish. These creatures can grow longer than the length of a bus, but as you can see, show remarkable speed and agility when hunting. Not all impressive hunters are large though. Many creatures adapted to life in the twilight zone have developed effective ways to catch their dinner in the dark. Some of these organisms are very small. These organisms are copepods, a type of crustacean, so related to shrimps. But these are tiny, just half a millimetre in size. That is just five times the width of a human hair. They feed by ambushing morsels of food that are unlucky enough to drift too close in the dark. Despite being tiny, relatives of these animals are thought to be important to how the ocean stores carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. More on that later. You might by now recognise this as a twilight zone animal. The green bioluminescence and the huge mouth maybe. Its close relatives, the cyclothony fishes, may be the most abundant vertebrate, that is an animal with a spine, on earth. That's more than chickens, pigeons or rats. This organism has a claim to fame of its own though. But first, a general knowledge quiz. Which is the largest migration in the natural world? From countless wildlife documentaries, you're probably very familiar with the sight of enormous herds of wildebeest on the move. Impressive, I grant you with around one and a half million migrating each year. This is nothing though. Huge numbers of birds migrate each year, moving between summer breeding grounds and places where they can avoid harsh winters. Even flocks of just one species, here starlings, can number hundreds of thousands. So how many are migrating globally? Five billion over 3,000 times more than all the wildebeest. 
and this is just in the USA. But even birds may not take the prize. You guessed it. We now think that the largest animal migration on Earth may take place in the twilight zone. Every day. They are the ocean's commuters. Each dusk, phenomenal numbers of creatures, fish, squid, shrimps, rise up nearer to the surface to feed, using the dark of night to avoid predators. At dawn, they move back down, deep, to wait until dusk comes round again. Even clouds covering the sun can be enough to trigger this vertical movement. This daily commute may be important in how life in the ocean influences the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The surface ocean is full of tiny plants called phytoplankton. Like trees and grasses, they use carbon dioxide to grow. There is no shortage of this in the ocean. The ocean absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and there is 50 times more carbon in the ocean than in the atmosphere. Although tiny in size, just one hundredth of the size of that already tiny copepod, collectively phytoplankton create huge amounts of new plant material each year. As much as all land plants combined, that includes all of the rainforests and all of the prairies. This phenomenal productivity supports the majority of life in the ocean. The phytoplankton are eaten by tiny creatures such as copepods, which in turn are eaten by bigger animals, and so on up to our friends the giant squid and the sperm whale. For the animals that are commuting up and down, by eating at the surface during night and respiring at depth in the day, they are transporting carbon dioxide away from the atmosphere and storing it deep in the ocean. This is part of what has been called the biological carbon pump. You don't have to be alive to contribute to the pump, though. This is marine snow. You can guess why, but when you know what it's made of, you'd be less tempted to make a snowball out of it. All the growth and feeding in the surface ocean creates a huge amount of detritus, oodles of dead creatures, and the waste products of living ones. All of this sinks, once again taking large amounts of carbon with it. This is another important component of the biological carbon pump. Without life in the ocean providing this pump, we think atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations could be 50% higher than they are even now. A critical aspect is how far this dead material gets before it is turned back into carbon dioxide. The deeper it gets, the longer it stays away from the atmosphere. Copepods, like those we saw earlier, actively feed on marine snow, such as 90% is recycled within the twilight zone. The 10% that escapes deeper may seem minor, but is still important in helping maintain atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. This role in the Earth's climate is something we need to keep in mind when weighing up the risks of taking resources from the ocean. There are three human activities in particular that may put the twilight zone under pressure. The first is what has been termed carbon dioxide removal, essentially using the ocean to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere with the aim of reducing future global warming. The second is a nodule, typically the size of a golf ball and rich in the metals we need for our technology. There are sites already being looked at for mining these on the seafloor. The third is the more familiar one, fish. Largely neglected until now, the twilight zone is starting to draw attention as a potential source of fish. Why? Numbers. There are half a billion tons of humans on Earth. Fish has long been a food source, no surprise given that the surface ocean has roughly one billion tons of fish. However, recent estimates indicate there may be many more in the twilight zone though there are still big uncertainties on the number. This fish in particular, Marolicus, though just a few centimetres long, is being considered as a new commercial species. Looking at this, and particularly remembering the fang tooth and bristle mouth, you might be inclined to favour the vegetarian option in a Twilight Zone restaurant. 
Fish are not always sought just for food though, at least not directly. Twilight zone fish, such as Marilicus, are more likely to be used for other purposes. Pick any pharmacy or health food shop and you will find shelves of fish oils purporting to boost our health. This is one likely use. Farmed salmon, a familiar staple of supermarkets, require food to grow. A common source of this food is other fish, such as Marilicus, processed into what is termed fish meal. The second of our three human impacts brings us to a notable anniversary. This year marks the 150th birthday of oceanography. In 1872, the Challenger expedition left Portsmouth. This is widely regarded as the start of ocean science and is commemorated in the name of the UK's leading society for marine science, the Challenger Society. It was the Challenger expedition that discovered mineral nodules on the seafloor. If you get a chance to visit the National Oceanography Centre, there is a small display about the Challenger expedition, including a replica of the figurehead inside the front lobby. This is what a nodule field looks like. Just one area, the clarion clipperton zone in the Pacific, spans over 3,000 miles, with 400,000 square miles already contracted to mining companies. In water over four kilometres deep, it is clearly a massive engineering challenge to collect these nodules. So why are we so keen? They are rich in metals, copper, manganese, cobalt, nickel, crucial for a range of technology, from smartphones to wind turbines and the batteries for electric cars. There are obviously concerns about the impact of collecting these from the seafloor. They use huge vehicles effectively a cross between a combined harvester and a hoover. The nodules have to be separated from the other mud and material harvested with them from the sea floor. And one plan is to release this waste as a plume in the twilight zone. Doing so may have consequences by affecting how twilight zone organisms feed. Now they are surrounded by poorly nutritious material that also makes it difficult to spot prey. The third pressure on the twilight zone is carbon dioxide removal. Faced with the potentially terrible consequences of climate warming, people are starting to consider options that would be inconceivable if things were not so pressing. We can all help by reducing our carbon footprints, but some want to go further by deliberately engineering removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Several of these schemes involve the ocean, by changing the ocean's chemistry, or by adding nutrients directly or pumping them from depth to accelerate the biological carbon pump that we saw earlier. All of these risk perturbing the twilight zone in ways we still don't fully understand. So eyes are turning to the twilight zone for what it may offer us. But how do we ensure that we do not do irrevocable damage to this important and still largely pristine ecosystem? You might be aware that we are in the United Nations Ocean Decade, which is due to run from last year until 2030. The Ocean Decade is a global initiative to develop a sustainable approach to the ocean. In their words, to provide the science we need for the ocean we want. Understanding how the new pressures on the twilight zone may impact the organisms that live there and the role they play in climate is a key part of that task. The National Oceanography Centre is very active in leading research into the twilight zone. Here are just three examples you can check out where we are looking at different questions concerning the twilight zone, particularly relevant to the biological carbon pump. You'll see we have an unfortunate soft spot for acronym. NOC also leads the programme that has been officially endorsed to focus on the twilight zone by the United Nations Ocean Decade, Jetson. Jetson already involves hundreds of people and projects from around the world, pooling resources, data, equipment and ideas. This reflects a recognition that only a combined global initiative can provide the understanding we need to make informed choices on how we interact with the twilight zone before it is too late. Before the end of the ocean decade, many school students will have chosen and be pursuing their careers. 
there will still be much we don't know about the twilight zone and the pressures are likely to be even greater. Just saying. We've covered a lot of topics, from near mythical creatures to the difficult decisions facing us as a society. Hopefully, the Twilight Zone is now at least one of the most bizarre, exciting and important places you have heard of. Thank you. <laughs>